IPAs. I miss the the Sierra Nevada from the states. Oh, and a good you know good PBR, and a good cheap I've PBR. I've had some of those. That tall boy. <laughs> well, good. Anyway, so you know what is so funny? You know, I told you the story, but people don't know that the the Phil's Camino movie one of, was one of the first movie that I watched about the Camino. I haven't even seen the way by the time I watched the the Phil's Camino. Hmm. Well, I hope you'll tell people that. I do. <laughs> if you I like to tell people that because um, sometimes I just think uh, the only film that anybody talks about is the way, and there's other great films. You know, it's amazing. I mean, of course, I'm completely biased because I'm part <laughs> of walking the Camino six ways to Santiago and Phil's Camino, here we go, Phil's Camino, mm -hmm. um, was uh, kind of a vision that I had and then it came true, which is really exciting. You know, because you had a vision for this conference and it came true and it's very satisfying, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, it is, good. It is. So tell us a little bit about the six way to Santiago because, you know, and also I always, you know, when I do the, the podcast, I always ask people, how did you find out about the Camino? Because, you know, we well, all I great. found out about the Camino um, in such a Camino way. Um, I'm a huge reader. I would read a book called Women Who Read Too Much. That would be like, oh, that's me. <laughs> and um, so I'm always reading something. And one day I just looked I don't even remember like looking for a book, but all of a sudden there was a book in my bookcase that was The Camino by um, Shirley MacLaine. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where I got it. I don't know when I got it. I don't know if somebody gave it to me. I don't know if I bought it. It was like, how did this book get here? I've never seen this book in my life. And there it was. So I picked it up and I started reading it and I loved it. I couldn't put it down because I loved this thing she was writing about, the Camino. You know, it's it's an interesting book and there were times where I might have skipped ahead a little bit, <laughs> but um, it's it really introduced me to the Camino and it really gave me the Camino fever. I thought to myself, God, I would love to do this. But I also remember I was very, just as strong a feeling was, I'll never do that. You know, when am I gonna have six weeks? and it's so far away and it's hard to get to and I've got all these responsibilities and jobs and everything. So it just seemed like, wow, that would have been great if I had come across it at a different time in my life. And that was in May and June of 2008. And I would say probably August or September, I got a phone call from the director, Lydia Smith, who's an old friend. And it was kind of like, hey, how are you good? How are you good? have you ever heard of the Camino? And I said, actually, yes, I read a book in May and June that I, it was amazing. I'm totally captured by the notion of the Camino. And she said, well, in May and June, I was walking the Camino and I've decided to do a documentary about it. And, you know, we started talking and the next thing you knew, I was, uh, came on as a, co-producer, so I started with pre-production right then and there, and then I was able to walk the Camino as part of that production. And I think what's really unique about Lydia, now first of all, she's brilliant. She's a brilliant filmmaker. I've, I've known her for years, I've seen her other films. She's really, really good at what she does. And second of all, I can't think of any other director of a Camino film who's actually walked the Camino before doing the film with no note of doing the film. She was a pilgrim. She was a true pilgrim walking the Camino. It wasn't until much later that she got the idea, mostly from people saying, you should do a documentary about this. She was resistant. So she knew what the experience was like to walk the Camino. So she knew she didn't want to a camera in somebody's face 24 seven, because that's not a pilgrim experience. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to do that. She didn't want to create that. She wanted to have pilgrims who were walking. And then every once in a while, she would check in with them and see how their journey was unfolding. And so that makes it very unique and very different from a lot of things that you see about the Camino. So, and also, like I said, I can't say it enough. She's brilliant. She's a brilliant filmmaker. And she really knows her stuff and she knows how to tell a story 
and she knows how to capture beauty. So, and she's also fearless in um, interviewing people. And I learned a lot from her. She is not afraid of emotions. She never, if someone has some emotions, her instinct is not like, oh, we better let them have their emotion. Her instinct as a filmmaker is like, that's okay. Tell me more. Tell me more. You know, so it was a it was a great experience. I saw her about once or twice a week for six weeks. And then I saw her at the end in Santiago. I think we were together a few days in Santiago. Then I went on to Finisterre for a few days, then came back. And um, it was a great experience. And uh, the film is wonderful. Is there any way we can ask your people if they've seen Walking the Camino? Yeah, yeah, we can ask again. Does anyone watch the, the movie? Was Walking it? the Camino, Six Ways to Santiago. If anyone has seen it, could they, can they indicate, like, raise their hand or give a thumbs up? <laughs> <laughs> I feel fun. so far from them. I just want to talk to them and listen to them <laughs> talk. But anyway, if they've seen it, they know how beautiful a film it is and how it, you, I think you can tell it's made by a pilgrim. You know what is the issue with some of these uh, the movies that they're American? That it is really hard to find for us in Spain. Uh, you have to look through, through a lot of hoops, you know, and some of them, they haven't even been translated. But in, for us, you know, as English speakers, for me to watch some of these movies, I will have to, you know, find a way because there's not really a place unless you know or, you know, like, you can yeah. watch it today, but some of these documentaries that they are like a, a bunch, probably with right now there's 25 or 30 great documentaries slash movies of the Camino that it's almost impossible to see. Well, I will say Lydia lived in Spain. She's a native, not native, she's a fluent Spanish speaker. And it was very important to her to have a Spanish version of the film. Mm -hmm. I just don't know where to tell you to find it, no. but I know it exists because we did play it there. We, we screened the Spanish version. And like I said, that was very important to her um, because she loves Spain and she lived there for a long time. Mm -hmm. so, um, so one of the gifts of the Camino and the gifts of the Camino are many, um, but one is that it really opened up a creative, a, a doorway to creativity that I hadn't previously felt was open. I hadn't noticed. So I've been very creative since I walked the Camino. I wrote a book about, about my experience. It's not really a travel guide. Actually, it's not a travel guide at all. <laughs> so it's a spiritual take on the Camino. So I wrote it as a series of 40 essays that talked about the spiritual musings that I had while I was walking my 40 day Camino. And I also ended up through walking the Camino Six Ways to Santiago, I met a man who lives in the Seattle area named Phil Volker. And he had seen walking the Camino and loved it. And he invited me to come walk what he called his backyard Camino. So he had sorry, was he already on his field mode walking or was that something that happened before? Was he already on his what? Well, he was already walking around his back here, or was that something yes. that happened? Okay. He was already, he had started in December, and I met him in March. Wow. So he had, he had seen walking the Camino and was just, like so many of us, he was absolutely smitten. He mm -hmm. was absolutely captured by it, but he was, he had stage four cancer and was undergoing treatments and just, you know, said, well, not going to do that. But mm -hmm. he didn't let that stop him. What he did was, he created a pathway around his property, around the perimeter that was, I think, 0 0.88 kilometers. Hmm. So it wasn't quite a kilometer to go around the perimeter of his property in a very rural part of an island off of Seattle. And um, he started walking and he kept track of where he was. So he wrote me this really phenomenal Facebook message where he, he said, I'm in Burgos right now. <laughs> in his backyard in Borgo, and he said, come walk with me. It was just a very lovely, charming letter. He, he appreciated walking the Camino six ways to Santiago. And he, um, he said, my, uh, my local priest came and blessed my Camino, so it's kosher. <laughs> and he just was lovely. And at the end, he said, come walk with me. 
And so I did. About two weeks later, I was in his backyard walking his Camino. That's amazing. And I just, from that very first day, I thought somebody should make a film about this guy. And then as it unfolded, and I would tell him that, and he would just laugh. He just thought that was the funniest thing ever. Um, I would go, no, Phil, I think I could make a good little film about you. I, I think I could do this. Because I got it. I saw what he was doing. He didn't see what he was doing. Really? I, I was a witness. He didn't see. And I would, I would propose that's true for all of us. You, yourself, you probably don't see your greatness. You don't walk around every day going, I'm great. I'm great. I love the Camino. And I put together this conference that no one had ever done before. I did that. That's me. You don't walk around doing that because that would be make you the most boring person on earth. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you're the most boring person on earth, you don't generally do that. It takes the people around you to go like, wow, man, that didn't exist. And now it's the final night. Like that's incredible what you did. Yeah. You pulled it off. You did that. And that's for you. For, you know, maybe for Marie, it's, you know, maybe she planned a, a huge party for her family where people weren't speaking to one another. And then after the party, they were like that. She did that, you know, and Guillermo has, you know, well, first of all, he's a per peregrino and a hospitalero. So, you know, he's got a lot he has of magic. A podcast also, he's interviewing probably in the last year. I don't know how many people, but he's, he's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, that's incredible, but he probably doesn't walk around. Like he doesn't wake up in the morning going, I'm so incredible. I've interviewed a thousand people for my podcast. You know, he's just doing his podcast. He's just getting breakfast. He's just walking around and it takes people like you and me and other people to go, wait, you what? You created a podcast and interviewed hundreds or thousands of people. That's incredible. So, we all need these witnesses and usually there are close friends and family but not always yeah. and if you're if you're feeling down it might be because you don't have a witness in your life and you might need to find one a lot of the times they're almost the same as cheerleaders but they're a little different because cheerleaders it sounds like i'm going to tell you you're great no matter what no the witness is like no you did this and and that's an undertaking and you did it so what if it wasn't what you you know like phil's camino did not win an oscar okay so what yeah like i could be oh we didn't win an oscar we didn't even get on the short list <laughs> so nobody could even vote for us i'm so sad because i think it's the best film ever or i could go like wow there wasn't a film about this guy and then there was that's pretty great you know, and that's what my witnesses tell me. They're like, who cares what it does? You made it. And I think that's a real lesson of the Camino. It's not about, you know, putting a notch in your belt. Like I walked six Caminos. Mm -hmm. Who cares? It's about, wow. I, you know, for some people, and maybe they're the people who are here now, their wives or husbands, their mothers or fathers, their they work all the time, they, their kids have softball practice, and they found two weeks to go walk the Camino, or one week, and, and, it, and, and because it meant something to them. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. But that's also part so, of the Camino, no? Like, at the end of the Camino, we all ended up being witnesses for one another. That's what exactly. The Camino, that you go being just humble, and as you say, 90% of the people that go there, they're super humble, and suddenly you meet people that because they are the witness for you and I did, you know, in this way, I feel so selfless because sometimes it's just for me. Like when I do the podcast, when I do this, you know, I, I'm the one that feels great, but yeah. I, I'm doing something for me first, but at the same time, I'm doing something for someone else, but I'm the one that is feeling great. I don't know yeah. if you, when you were doing the movies, the same, I'm like, you're doing the movie for Phil, but you're the one getting all the feedback, getting the, to see Phil's life. I'm like, well, anybody here, and my guess is that of the people who are watching right now or watching tomorrow, or watching whenever, you you either are currently doing some sort of service for your community. Maybe you're, you know, working in a soup kitchen or maybe you're visiting people at the hospital 
-hmm. you know, we, we all do service. And anyone who's ever done service will say exactly what you just said. Oh, yeah, I feed, but I get fed there. I get so much by being there, being of service to the kids in this cancer ward where I bring toys. I get so much. So it's almost like not something to feel guilty about. It's like a signpost, like, yep, you're going the right way. That's your yellow arrow. That's your yellow arrow. If you feel like you're getting more than you're giving, that's your yellow arrow. Because keep giving more. Keep giving more. Just give more. You know, if you're not in a service position, find one. Just do something for somebody. Even if it's just, you know, you read a GoFundMe about somebody who um, is down on their luck. Send them $10 or $20 or whatever you can afford, maybe $100. You know, if you, if you know that your neighbor just had surgery, bake them a casserole. <laughs> you know, like ask them to give, tell them I'm going to the store tomorrow at 9 a.m. Please have your list ready so that I can get you what you want. We can all do service. And, and I think you said something so wise. On the Camino, we are witnesses for each other. Even if we don't speak the same language, if you have a rough day on the Camino, you climbed something that was really hard, or you went on a downhill that was really difficult, you get to that albergue at the end of the day and you see somebody who did the same thing, all you have to do is look at each other and you've just witnessed like, oh, you did it too, we did that. I know, I know the feeling, you know, it's this, you know, sitting down on the albergue, when you have a sour, you're clean and you just smile to someone else. <laughs> Just that smile, that look into the eyes, and yeah. I know what you're feeling, I know where you're going, and I'm feeling the same way. Yeah, yeah. So we might not have it spelled out as broadly when we're not on the Camino because we mm -hmm. didn't necessarily walk down that same yeah. rocky hill, but we could. We could, because aren't we all going through this thing called life with ups and downs and turnarounds? Yeah. We could look at everybody that way. You know, when I was, um, so I, I have this film, Phil's Camino, it's a short documentary, and I, I was getting it into a movie theater in LA. So there was a lot of back and forth. I had to call this, my, my contact guy was named Greg. Never met him, but we were on the phone constantly. And one day we're on the phone and just figuring out some business thing. And when he hangs up the phone, he says, okay, I love you, bye-bye and hung up and I was like, oh my God, Greg just said he loved me. Like, <laughs> I, bet he, I bet he thought I was his wife, you know, like for a second, he just was like, okay, love you, bye. I was like, oh, I can't wait to tell him about that. <laughs> like, should I call him back now and say, Greg, you just said you love me. And I just thought, you know, I'm talking to him tomorrow or something the next day. The next time I called him at near the, after we did all of our business, I said, you know, Greg, The last time we hung up, you told me you loved me. I, did you think I was your wife? Was that like a knee-jerk reaction or something? He goes, no. I said, but you said you loved me. And he goes, I do. I love you. And it was so amazing. We had never met in person. Mm -hmm. And he's happily married. And he just had love for me. So I was, I, that really like made me think like, wow, could it be true? Yeah, it could be true. It could be true. We, don't we do that for one another when there's a terrible thing happens in Spain? We're like, oh my God, hang in there. We love you. Or, you know, right now there was a tornado in uh, Arkansas and people all over America are like, oh, you know, we love you. We love you. So I was like, yeah, I could love Greg. <laughs> and Greg could love me. That's funny, you know, no. there was a research a while ago that they were trying to get teenagers, you know, that we are so used to say, I love you on social media, you know, hard, hard, you are my best. But when you get them face to face to say, I love you, they get blocked because we think that love, you know, if we see it as a physical, it's a thing that, but once you go into the community, it's one of the things that a lot of people that are like, you know, the many ways, many countries, many ways of saying hi, so that we, we have to say, I love you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I really, really gave this a lot of thought. And I hope you will too. And I hope the people who are here will too. So I decided, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do what Greg did. So I thought, um, you know, I was at the store. And here in America, we have this store called Trader Joe's. Oh, and everybody loves yes. it. Hopefully we'll get it one day here. <laughs> 
it's just, you know, and, and people come and they're like, what's the big deal? But it's just a very, it's a small store. It's not huge. It's a small yeah. store. And get to know the store and, you know, right where you to get the things that you like. And so people become like, what's your Trader Joe's? <laughs> you know, what's, I go to Silver Lake Trader Joe's. What's your Trader Joe's? And um, so I go to my Silver Lake Trader Joe's and um, I went in there and I was checking out from a guy that I know, Willard. I've known him for a long time. And I told him the story about Greg. And, it, and he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And at the end, I said, Willard, I love you. And he went, I love you too. And then every time I went there, it was like, oh, I can't wait to see Willard, you know? <laughs> and we would say, I love you to each other. I don't even know if Willard knew my name. I mean, he did it one time, but maybe he forgot. You, you know what I mean? It's not like we were significant to one yeah. another outside of Trader Joe's. But I was able to go, I love you. And he was able to say, I love you. And it's just, you know, it enriches our life. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit, I think we're going a little bit, but look, talking about love, you know, uh, who was Phil? And like for many people, you know, I know that a lot of people, they haven't seen the movie. They're not the lucky ones like me. And for, <laughs> me, for me, it really changed me. It was something that, you know, when things happen on in my life right now, it's, it's, it's one of those movies that, you know, it's recognized by people that have seen it. But as you say, you know, it's not the way, it's not been there, but it should be. Because there's a story about a human, <laughs> real human being and a real life yeah. story. And for me, I will, I always wanted to to interview Phil, and now with him passing mm. away, you know, one of the things that that I think, and today is the you know the memorials of of Elias that passed away, and a lot of people ask me, who would you like to to have? A, you know, I think Guillermo is the one that in his podcast always asks us, who would you like to interview? And I say, mm. Elias, with this Santiago, and I and he was like, nobody ever answered that. I'm like, and we are losing, you know, these stories of the people that made the Camino. And that's part of the Camino also. And that's why we oh, start you know, the Camino people, because at the end, it's all about the people. So you absolutely fails for you. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that because anytime you ask a pilgrim, like, show me pictures of your Camino, they show you some beautiful mountains and valleys, but then they go like, oh, look at these guys. And they show you these pictures of these extremely ordinary looking people. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they're sweaty and sometimes they're like, ah, and sometimes they're goofy, but they're extremely ordinary looking. And yet when your friend shows you, they're like, oh, this is, you know, Mark from Germany. And oh, look, here's Catalina from Romania. Look at, oh, we walk together. And they talk about them in a way that it's somewhere way past celebrity, <laughs> getting up towards sainthood because it's exactly right. The Camino is the people on the Camino. And when people say they're frustrated because I want to go, I want to go. I, you know what? Your people must not be ready yet. And your people are getting ready too, because when you go, you're going to meet your people. Mm -hmm. And maybe one of them lives in Sweden and is caring for an aging parent right now. They can't go yet, but they'll be able to go when you go and you will meet them and you will know exactly why you go at that time. It was you, to meet that person. You know what is funny? That my first Camino was supposed to live one week. I left the week before because something happened in my family and ended up being meeting these amazing people, you know, meeting this amazing girl and one thing led to there and, and here I am. Yeah. It's it we can't fight it. You know, you can't fight it. So you have to just kind of settle in and go, okay, I guess I wasn't supposed to go in 2021. I guess I'll be going in 2022 or or whatever it is. Certainly there were delays before COVID yeah. too. But um, so but to answer your question, so Phil was, I used to tell Phil, he was so ordinary. He was <laughs> extraordinary, you know, and that's really true. Phil was the most ordinary guy. He was extraordinary. And I feel very lucky that I met him. I feel very lucky that he agreed to let me make a film about him. And I feel very lucky that he lives on in his film. He lived way past what any of his doctors thought mm -hmm. he would live. Um, and anybody who wants to see the film, just go to Phil's Camino on Vimeo On Demand. I have to admit, I'm not that technologically gifted, so it's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to send me an email at philscamino at gmail, you can do that and I'll send you the link. 
and it there is a a price there's a cost like a movie ticket but if this is a tough time for you just send me an email and i'll i'll send you a pass because i don't want anybody to not see it just because they're having a tight moment mm -hmm. so you know he was just a guy who heard about the camino and decided he wanted to do it and one of the things that was amazing about phil was he took what some people would think is a bad thing which is getting cancer mm -hmm. And he turned it into what he called one of the greatest gifts of his life. He considered cancer one of the greatest gifts of his life. He said he had three C's, cancer, the Camino, and becoming a Catholic. Late in his wow. life, he became a Catholic. I didn't and know he, that. Yes, he became a Catholic. And uh, my friend who's a priest, when I was telling him about Phil, I said, He's a new Catholic. And he goes, oh, those are the worst. <laughs> I agree. Amen to that. I'm Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he was just kidding. He was just kidding. But, you know, oh. Phil loved being a Catholic. And, you know, that also, I was raised Catholic. And I more or less drifted from the Catholic religion. It was really interesting for me to see somebody so excited about being Catholic. It made me reevaluate evaluate what am I really excited about in my own spiritual life? And if there's, you know, if you, the answer, you know, I invite you to ask yourself that question. And if the answer is nothing, you know, you might want to get busy, find some spiritual thing that you're actually excited about. So, um, so he was uh, just this guy walking in his backyard to the end, you know, a few weeks before he, he passed away in October, he said, um, there was some Facebook thing that said, if someone was going to write a book about your life, what would it be called? And his title was Walking in the Mud. You know, and that's what he used to say to me when I said, I'd like to make a film about you. He'd be like, I'm just a guy walking in the mud. But he just was a really amazing human being. And I'm very lucky to have known him. And I'm very lucky to have been the steward to make this film to share him with the world because his message is really powerful and his message is really inspiring um, for all of us. Yeah, you know, a lot of people when I contact them and they are like, they're, they're like Phil's, you know, why do you want to interview me? I'm just a normal guy. I'm like, that's why. Because this, <laughs> yes. there is a million of normal guys out there that they don't want to meet the, the amazing, you know, Superman or the amazing influencer that we're- to That's what I'm saying. They we don't witness our greatness. The guy. They want the one that yeah. they can say, that's me. I'm Phil. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. be doing all of this. And do you know how Phil got in touch with the Camino? Why he decided to walk the Camino? He watched the way. He watched the way. Okay, so it's one of those yeah. Americans then, that is just the way. And then shortly after that, he watched walking the Camino six ways to Santiago, okay. and that's when he reached out to me. And what um, what happened for him to start walking? You know, because I seen the movie, because but I know people that not why he needed to start. You know, for me, if I told anyone that I'm gonna be doing the Camino on my house, it would be like you're nuts. I'm like, why? Just go for a walk, go anywhere else. But why was Phil's motivation of start walking around the house? Well, because he couldn't travel. That's number one. If he didn't have cancer and didn't have um, uh, chemo treatments every two weeks, mm -hmm. he might have just hopped on a plane and gone. Although he also said, and I have two versions of the film. I have the 28-minute version and a 56-minute version. So... You know, in the 56 minute version, he goes a little bit more into that. And he said, you know, he told his doctor about the way and he told his doctor, like, man, I'd love to walk that someday, but, you know, whatever. And his doctor, who is a very spiritual guy, he <laughs> fascinated, he was fascinated with that. So he would write in Phil's chart, you know, every time he saw him, like, Phil's doing really well and hope, hopes that he can go to Spain to walk the Camino and Phil's doing well with his exercises, getting ready for Spain. And uh, Phil's, you know, looking, things are looking good for Phil to go to Spain. And Phil would go, Doc, I'm not going to Spain. I don't have the time and I don't have the money. And his doctor was just like, whatever, Phil's getting ready to go to Spain. And I'll tell you, there's something in America where if you, um, there are people who pass away, they die, and they haven't settled their affairs. 
And so they might have a bank account or stocks or something, and that money is not claimed. Mm -hmm. And it goes into this kind of unclaimed money bank or fund somewhere. But if you can prove that it's your money, you get to get it. Okay. So somebody told Phil, like, I found $200 of unclaimed money. You should try this. And Phil filled out whatever paperwork it was, and he found $17,000 from his mother that his wow. mother had squirreled away over the years. And here he was going through this very expensive treat. You know, it was a godsend. And it also had a little bit in there for him to go to Spain. Wow. So it was just kind of this, it's like his mom sent him to Spain. That's incredible. Yeah. So what happened when finally, you know, the, the walking around the house became the, we are going to Spain? Well, he got, so he, his one doctor was writing that all the time. And he was just like, you're crazy, doc. <laughs> and then at one point, his other, so he had two doctors. And his, his onc oncologist doctor um, said to him, well, you know, we're going to do a scan. And if your scan is really good, we could give you one chemo treatment off. So you we, wouldn't have to be here every two weeks. Yeah. You would have a chemo holiday. You'd have, <laughs> you'd have a month. And that's what he ended up, he, so they were all waiting for the scan to come back and he had a good scan. So he had a chemo holiday. Wow. So I'm telling you, they told him this in June. He got the scan, I think at the end of June or the beginning of July, and he left July 24th. So it all happened very fast when it happened, when he finally said, okay, you can make a movie about me. So I had time to get a crew up to do some shooting before he left. Mm -hmm. And then I had time to get a crew together to go with him to Spain. I was touring with Walking the Camino six ways to Santiago, so I couldn't go. They shot. And then when they came back, I went up with the crew. Wow. So it was just one of those things. And Phil says, because my book is not like most Camino books, it's not like, oh, I took this street and that street and then I had lunch here and, you know, I saw this beautiful cathedral. It's a little bit different. It's really about, I mean, it's called Everyday Camino with mm. Annie because I believe your your Camino is right now. Like right now, you know, David, uh, Diego's on the Camino and Adriana's on the Camino and Joe Pilgrim's on the Camino. You know, we're all, this is it. We're mm -hmm. on the Camino. Totally. You're on the Camino. So Phil's, and that's what Phil did. He just decided his backyard was Spain and he was walking. So Phil liked to say that I wrote the textbook and he had the lab. <laughs> so, so because both of we shared this belief that Santiago is just a stop along the way of your Camino. And, you know, it's happening now. It's happening today. It's happening right here. And um, one of the you know, one of the things that I see today that nowadays, you know, I mean, it's became kind of like the normal thing to say that we have taken so many things for granted, you know, for us, the Camino was something that we get for granted, that it was going to be there forever. And for Phil, you know, when cancer hits you and suddenly, you know, you're like, oh, maybe I'm not going to be able to do it ever in my life. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to do something that I wanted. How was for Phil's, you know, feeling that being there, a life dream and being with him, you know, in that kind of journey? Well, you know, he says in the film, you know, it's just, he cried almost every day because the round beauty. And I think for American people, um, maybe I should just speak for myself, but in all of the, you know, people talk, oh, you should go to Hawaii, or oh, Belize is the most beautiful place on earth, or oh, this. Nobody ever said Northern Spain. <laughs> but <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> you should. <laughs> we all should. Like, you know, there, you there's know, a great family really? and, and they're from LA. They used to be filmmakers. Now they live on a on a boat. The old towners, they quit everything. And Jessica, the mom, once told me on the on the on the podcast, skip Disney, go Camino. And I'm like, I'm gonna make a t-shirt for every American, you know, skip Disney, take your kids to the Camino. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so stunningly beautiful. And you know, everywhere you turn. And so 
I think that's something that sometimes gets left out of the descriptions of the Camino. It's like, oh, it's beautiful. And it, no, it, it's, it is seriously has got to be one of the most beautiful parts of this planet. And, you know, and, and so then when you think of what I just said before, even more than the Camino is the people. That's how beautiful the relationships are on the Camino, the friendships, the, the witnessing that we do for one another. Because you are in such a beautiful place, and yet still what's so much more powerful is the connections with the other human beings. And what was so. the toughest part for you? Like, you know, when we see the life of someone else, but for you also, you mentioned that you weren't there with Phil's in the Camino, but you were the one putting together that whole thing. What is the toughest part of deciding what goes into a movie? What doesn't go into a movie? And a lot of people, they, you know, and I talk with Mark, and he's also doing the documentary, and how do you get the real Camino when you know you have a camera in front of you? Well, you know, I told my team the same thing to, to shoot it the way I was shot, which is don't be on top of them 24-7. You take a couple days, have your own Camino, and then meet up with them somewhere else and, you know, have a rest it because they're carrying all their gear and everything. So it's like shoot one day, rest the next day. You know, this is not reality TV, please. This is not get every moment of his day. And, you know, the other thing is who wants to go through all that footage? You know, it's like, that's just, you create a whole other problem for yourself when you shoot every darn thing. And, you know, I heard these, um, these filmmakers, have you seen the, the doc called The Truffle Hunters? Which one? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. It's called The, the Truffle Hunters. It's no. a documentary that came out this past year. Well, if anybody on your, if anybody there has seen it, they know it is a stunningly beautiful documentary. And it's really, really good. And I heard the filmmakers and they said, you know, documentary filmmakers, it's usually what's called run and gun. Like you're always ready to shoot, 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 use your iPhone as backup, you know, like shoot, <laughs> shoot, shoot. And he said, you know, we were kind of the opposite on the truffle hunters. And when you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. I it is so will. beautifully lit. So they took a lot of time setting up their camera. And so if somebody said, oh, so-and-so is going out truffle hunting right now, they're like, we're, we're, we're married to this shot now. You know, <laughs> we just set this up for a while. You know, and it, whether it was indoors or outdoors, knowing that somebody was about to walk by and they got just the right angle and everything that they wanted, they said it was the first time they they did um, slow shooting on a documentary instead of run and gun. And, you know, so that's more like a narrative film. But mm -hmm. in any case, I wanted to make sure that Phil had his Camino experience, that he wasn't having some sort of a reality TV experience on the Camino. This was going to be his only Camino. Mm -hmm. So this is the one I wanted him to have. So I also identified themes that I wanted, that I felt, you know, and that's the other thing about a documentary is you plan, but then the film emerges yeah. the way it's supposed to be. So I was really interested in these, the, the concept of light and dark. And so, you know, the, that's, and that was part from his journey through cancer, the lightness and the darkness, you know, the darkness is, ah, you have a fatal disease, a terminal illness, but the lightness of him feeling like it was a gift so I told the, the team, look for light and dark. Look for it visually, look for physical light and dark mm -hmm. opportunities, but look for it thematically as well. You know, it, are there light things that are happening that make him feel maybe a sadness? Or is there a sadness that turns into joy? Like look for the themes of light and dark. So, so and then just, you know, catch what you can and, and make it beautiful. <laughs> And suddenly you have um, 20 something hours a day yeah. of editing and cleaning and, and post producing, and finally you have a documentary. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's a woman in, in America named Annie Hesp, and she's uh, she takes students. She works at a university and she takes students every year on the Camino. And she was really helpful with walking the Camino Six Ways to Santiago. She showed it to her students. She had us come out there and you know, she's been a big supporter. And when I told her I was going to do Phil's Camino, she said, are you crazy? <laughs> you know how hard it is to make a film about the Camino. Mm -hmm. Are you crazy? You're going to do another one? I was like, 
oh yeah, it is hard, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I didn't, I, and you know, it's tough, it's tough. I'm not an independently wealthy person who can just foot the bill. So I have to go and ask people for help. Yeah. And by help, I mean money usually. And so that's very humbling also to say like, hey, I've got this great idea for a film. Would you like to participate? And you know, here's what I can offer you. I can offer you your name in the credits, you know, which sounds kind of cheesy, but every time I watch the film, I watch the credits and I get a lump in my throat because those people got the film made and they didn't do it for themselves. They did it for all the people who are watching it now mm -hmm. that they never met, they never will meet. And I am, I guess I need to say this, I am making a new film. It has nothing to do with the Camino, but I'm once again in the position of like, would you participate? Would you participate in what I think is an uplifting, inspiring, beautiful film? And I don't have the money to make it. <laughs> So do you want to be part of my village? Do you want your name in the credits? And, you know, it's interesting too, when I would tell people about Phil's Camino, I'd say, well, it's about a man with stage four cancer. And they'd go, oh, yeah, sounds it's sad. One of those sad movies that are- yeah. yeah. And it was like, well, it's actually not a sad movie. And they go, the guy's got cancer, right? And I'd say, yeah, but it's really inspiring. And this is the same thing. It's about pandemics which is the mainly the AIDS crisis in New York City, mm -hmm. but it's so uplifting just in the same way. And, you know, if you've seen Phil's Camino, maybe you can get a sense of my storytelling and, you know, you think, well, she deserves 10 bucks to try again, <laughs> get my name in the credits of a film, you know, a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, you know, what you donate matters not because god doesn't see degree why should i you know i just see people supporting people supported phil's camino people are supporting my new film is called i'll miss you later and that's what pilgrims do isn't it we support each other and it doesn't always have a financial tie it might just be keep up the good work that's supporting you know and just being here, you know, you were saying today that, you know, we all have our own Camino and your Camino is through movies and documentaries. You're still walking your Camino, you know, and I see this topic in your movies. They're always the uplifting, they're looking for, you were saying at the beginning, you know, you are the light that signs in those stories that are going to be forgotten. And Phil was one, now you're with new movie. And yeah. we're in the same way, you know, it's not about giving. And like here you're giving your time and in a busy, you know, weekend instead of being outside, having fun. Here we are putting our time and effort. And as you say, you know, we don't do it for the recognition. We don't do it for anything. We're doing to help others. And at the end, isn't that all in life? You know, it's what you do. And, and, and I agree with you that sometimes you're saying a good message. Sometimes we start talking, just go with a friend, have a beer, just say good job and give recognition, share with your friends. You know, now, now with social media, the easiest thing to say is to answer it. You know, the more people we get, the more people will find that one that has two million euros away hiding that doesn't need and maybe it will go for you and me. So great. But yeah. Yeah. It, you know, why, why wait? You know, if you know that your friend has just navigated a difficult part of their career hmm. or just left one job because it wasn't satisfying and went to another job, why not take them out for a beer and say, I admire how you did that. You know, that's inspiring to me to make sure that I take care of myself the way you took care of yourself or, you know, my dad passed away from ALS and it's it's terrible disease, but it it did give the opportunity for his friends to come by and talk to him. And it blew my mind. This one guy, they, they all made pilgrimages and this one guy made a pilgrimage to see my dad. And he I wasn't there, but my brother and sister in law were. And they said it was the most incredible thing. He were here were these older guys who are not exactly known for talking about their feelings. <laughs> and this guy sat there and he talked to my dad and he goes, you know, we met because of this project that you brought me in on in Hartford, Connecticut. And he goes, nobody, it was my first big project. Nobody had entrusted me. And it took a long time and a lot of hard work. And it's still to this day, one of the things I'm most proud of. 
and you made that happen. You set my career on the direction that it's going. You did that. And my sister-in-law said it was incredible to hear this kind of testimonial. And it was beautiful. And, you know, if he had just had a heart attack or died in a car accident, he wouldn't have had that. So going through that difficult disease, there were some gifts like that. And it was it was good for me. And I think my family to recognize that even in the sadness, there were some real gifts. It was always my like one of the things that I always say with COVID, people are like COVID has been horrible, but for me. It's also been the time that allows me to meet people like you. I'm like, I don't know why the pilgrim community has become one through all these Zoom meetings, you know, through social media. I have the incredible chance to meet people that in any other way, we probably will never met. Yeah. So there's all- Yeah, and you know, COVID for me, um, I was feeling, I'm a very, you know, all of the antisocial people were going, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to go out of my house. And I'm the opposite. I'm such a social person. And it was like, what? You mean I don't see anybody outside of my pod? Ah, but um, I started Pilgrimage in Place, which is a Facebook group that everybody's invited, Pilgrimage in Place. And we did weekly Zooms with authors and filmmakers. And we just met every Saturday for, I think for like a year. And then um, a pause and we've had a couple and we had one this morning and we're having another one this afternoon where we, um, we all read a book together. I think I'm using it to cool off my computer. We all read this, <laughs> Cafe Auk. It's okay. by Bibi Barami. And she's written a travel guide to the Camino and the sacred mm-hmm. Spain sites. And um, this is when she lives along the Camino in France. And, you know, we just, we get together and we're, we created this beautiful community online. And it was really a lifesaver. Not just for, you know, people say that to me. It's like, no, for me too. It was great to have this community in a time when community was hard to come by. Mm. So everybody's invited. Come on over. We call it PIP, Pilgrimage in Place. And um, we just write about the pilgrimages that we're going through in our neighborhoods. You know, people, it's not as active a site, a Facebook site as it used to be, but people would write about like, yeah, I... I walked on the beach and I've never seen, you know, this particular tree. And they put up a picture of this really beautiful tree. It's like, how did you miss that tree? But the same thing in my own neighborhood. I'm walking through a city neighborhood in LA Mm -hmm. and yet I'm seeing some stunningly beautiful things because we're all on our pilgrimage right in the place that we are. So that was a big, uh, big gift for me and, you know, I interviewed John Brerley. I interviewed Rebecca Scott, who wrote Furnace Full of God, which is a beautiful book. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Kevin Codd twice for both of his books, Field of Stars and Beyond the Field of Stars. Amazing. And Jack Hitt, I interviewed Jack Hitt. He wrote the book that The Way is based on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was just, it was great. It was wonderful. And, and anyway, me, all of that is in the files at Pilgrimage in Place. So we'll have to go if you anyway. like watching interviews, come and watch those interviews. Which First, we'll really have wonderful. to interview you for the podcast and because this yes. doesn't count. Anyway, we're Anytime. starting at the beginning, you know, how when you help someone, you know, we're saying how we get so much. And I would love to know, you know, we, we know that Phil was amazing. He has passed away. He also get all his friends and family there. But what, what would you say will be Phil's gift to you? Phil's gift to me. You know, Phil's gift to me is that nobody can tell you something is bad. You know, he got cancer, which that would be a bad thing, you would think. And he, to the end, felt that it was one of the biggest gifts of his life. That's an incredible Um, power. Like seeing the whole something bad and became something great. And the great minded normal people, as you were saying, you know, the, the, the people that walk in the mud, that's the one that they know that once they walk for a while, they will get out of the mud and, you know, you learn from that and they make it a, a great time. Yeah. And, you know, he also reminded me of the 
gift of laughter. I mean, I love to laugh. So I'm always watching comedies. I have never seen not even one Game of Thrones. I, I don't watch violent stuff. Nothing. I love, what's that? No, never. Never. Wow. I, I don't even know what channel it's on or anything. I, I read I the books and I, I have to watch the TV show, but you know, it's funny because for me, <laughs> I have a, a, an earpiece. So usually sometimes in the Camino when I'm alone, I am watching a stand-up comedy and I'm laughing on the street by myself. <laughs> so people think that I'm nuts. And also to keep my English, I watch a stand-up comedy in English. So I will, I may be walking by that or being in the car, just laughing my ass off. And yes, I, it's just... I love comedy. And, you know, uh, I, I can't remember if it was the last time or the second to last time I was up visiting Phil, but it was just a few months ago. And um, <laughs> we watched the the movie called My Cousin Vinny. Are you familiar with My Cousin like in Vinny? In Spain, we have this great tradition of changing every name of the movie. Oh, that's Something right. Something that yeah. makes sense in Spanish. Well, the, the joke in the film is that this city lawyer is now in the deep south in the country. So it's that kind of fish out of water thing. Yeah. And to add to that, he has a very thick... Brooklyn accent. <laughs> and the court and the judge, they have very thick Southern accents. So there are times when they just don't understand each other. And the one of the biggest jokes is the Brooklyn guy is talking about two young people. And he says two youths. The word is youth. But he says the TH like a T. Yeah. So he goes, these two youths. And the judge says two youths like what's a ute you know <laughs> like what, what are you talking about and meanwhile he doesn't understand the problem he keeps going two youths you know two youths and he's pointing to the two young people two youths so this goes back and forth so it's a big joke in the thing and then he finally explains it young people or youths so the next day and we're laughing our butts off on the couch at Phil's watching this late one night. And um, the next day we're at church and Phil at this point was using a walker. So we walked and there's a spot that was saved for him up at the very first row of the church. So we go up and we're sitting in the front, you know, and we get there early cause you know, he's a good Catholic. <laughs> there's, there's no sneaking in the back. This is like, he's got there on time. He can take his choice of seats. So we're sitting there and then the, the priest and the altar boys and girls come in. So I'm sitting there with Phil and we're just, everybody's quiet and the altar boy and the girl are actually on our side. And um, Phil gives me a little nudge and I think, oh, he's going to drop some of this wisdom on me, you know, like <laughs> something about God. And uh, he nudges me and he just kind of looks with his head over to the kids and he goes two youths <laughs> i was just like oh my god you know that right. again he's just seeing the joy seeing the humor he never wasted time bemoaning the fact that he had cancer or being afraid mm -hmm. he just used his time and it's one of the last things that he said. Um, we had a Zoom for my pilgrimage in place. We did a Zoom with, with Phil on October 9th. Wow. And Phil passed away on October 10th. And let me tell you, nobody saw that coming. He did not look frail or the day before he was about to die. He looked great. And it's, it's wonderful. You know, as his wife says, he had one bad day, mm -hmm. you know, that next day. So he said, he goes, you know, you could waste a lot of time being afraid. Mm -hmm. And he goes, people are afraid of dying because that's not what you should be afraid of. What you need to worry about is not living fully. So if you're living fully, you're not wasting time being afraid. Mm -hmm. You're just living fully. And I can't remember where it was or if it was even in the long version of the film. He said, you know, if you want to be afraid, you can be afraid. But that's taking some time that maybe you could be playing with your grandkids yeah. or maybe you could be helping a neighbor. 
and you're you're using it to be afraid. So, you know, it's kind of like simple time management. <laughs> like, where do you want to put your time management? Like, play with those grandkids or help your neighbor or go make a donation at a school or just go buy a bag of groceries for somebody. I, I you know, a zillion, infinite number of things you could do that are more worthwhile than mm -hmm. spending time being afraid. Totally. So that's Phil's, he taught me so much. So, but those are kind of the biggies. Yeah. And he was always laughing. Even the first day I met him when I was walking his backyard Camino, he said to me, you know, I have stage four cancer. And I said, I know, Phil, that's, that's tough. I, I feel for you. And he goes, I'm getting an A in cancer. <laughs> <laughs> he, oh, yeah, he said, I, there, I, I have stage four cancer. There is no stage five. I'm getting an A in cancer. You know, and he just was like that. He just was finding ways to joke. But yeah, you know, here in Spain, I live in the north where we used to have a lot of tourism and we used to make jokes, you know, the next day out of that. And and that's one of the things that a lot of people, you know, maybe in the States, they will ask me, like, how can you laugh about that? I'm like, if you don't laugh about the bad things in life, you know, that's the way to get around. And, and a lot of people are like, what? I know I have cancer. What do you want me to do? Better laugh at it and have the best, no, and enjoy it to the fullest that that's what you have. There's nothing you can do about it. So. Yeah, Phil was um, Phil was sitting on the edge of his bed. So Phil, you know, again, <laughs> he had such an incredible life. About was it a year ago or two years ago? A couple of years ago, he got invited to go to Lourdes with the Knights of Malta. Mm -hmm. So he had to bring a caretaker with him, and it wouldn't work for his wife to go with him. So he asked Father Tom, that's the father who made the joke, like, oh, those new Catholics, they're the worst. <laughs> father Tom went with them and Father Tom and Phil were like, believe me, two peas in a pod. Even Father Tom said, I think we share some DNA. <laughs> uh, father Tom, for, for over 30 years, he was, a, um, he was the padre, he was, the, um, he was in the Navy. Okay. So he worked with Navy and Marines guys all his career. Yeah. So, um, and Phil was a Marine, which was very important to him. So, uh, so they go off to Lourdes and Father Tom, one morning he gets up and he sees Phil is sitting on the edge of his bed. So he thinks, oh, he must be praying or something. Father Tom goes and takes a shower. And when he comes back, Phil is in the same position. And he's like, did this guy die? Is this like, oh my God. And he says, Phil, you okay? And Phil goes, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. He goes, what are you doing? And he said, I'm talking to my tumors. And Padre goes, well, what are you saying to them? And Phil goes, well, I'm telling them, if I go, you go. So it's in everybody's <laughs> interest to string this out as long as possible. <laughs> so, so, you know, wow. that's what he was saying to his tumors. Let's string this out, guys. So, I want to start making t-shirts with Phil's, you know, quotes. I know, with Philisms, right? Philisms. Yeah. Yeah, well, this will be a website. And, you know, that's one of the things we wanted to create a place where we can keep all these amazing stories because I really think that there's someone out there that, you know, maybe is having a rough time, maybe he's having cancer, and maybe he, we got him to laugh and to see the, the beauty of, you know, someone that went through that and... That's what we're saying, you know, Phil, a total normal person can become, you know, the biggest, highest influencer for someone out there. Yeah, yeah. It's Well, that's his, you know, he starts the film by saying he used to have a practice of everyone that he met, he wanted to give them a gift. And the film is Phil's final gift to everyone, to everyone, to people he'll never meet. That's his gift. Will we ever see him in, a, in a Spanish? I would love it to be in Spanish. What do I have to do to get it in Spanish? <laughs> I can help you translate um, it. Uh, we have a couple uh, of friends that they do voices and for movies, so maybe we can set up a group of people. Well, I, you know, that's the thing. And I think this is kind of the vestige of the Franco years. You know, uh, dubbing was really big in yeah, Spain. We are the best ones. We're, right, but in other countries, they just did subtitles. Yeah. 
which I think that's why like all the people from Denmark speak perfect English because they're yeah. all watching, you know. Here we are Spanish. Friends. Your English is no bueno. <laughs> it's true. But you know, hey, I'm from a country where most people only speak one language. Yeah. So yeah. I, so yeah. you know, I, I got I got I got no stones to throw. How do you call uh, someone I, that speaks two languages? What? Bilingual. Someone that speaks three. Trilingual. Bilingual. Someone that speaks one. American. <laughs> I love it. Never heard that one before. No. I love <laughs> it. I love it. <laughs> But I will say, I when I walked the Camino the first time, I mostly was with French people. Okay. Spoke French the whole way, and they were like, "Are you really American?" I'm like, yes, but I went to school <laughs> in France. <laughs> but and then the second time, um, I was speak, I was with a French person. I I walked the Primitivo, so it was much less people. There was a French person, a um, Italian person. I speak Italian. I'm part Italian. Yeah, we're having some issues with Annie. We will be waiting a little bit. Oh, there you oh, are. You're back. Oh, now I, I can't hear you, though. I okay. can hear you, yeah. Could you hear me? Because I couldn't hear you. Yes, now, okay. yeah. OK. So anyway, yes, I love languages. So I'm a little bit of an unusual um, American. but. I'm always encouraging everyone to brush up their Spanish before they go. And people seem to have a good luck with these online programs now, so yeah. it's easier to do. This was, I always said, you know, the, the way I learned English was watching movies and TVs in English, watch documentaries in Spain, and now I'm trying Chinese. That's another level. Wow, good for you, though. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Three years, I stopped for my master's. Now I remember E R S N S W O. Anyway, funny. Annie, thank you so much for being here for make us laugh. You know, oh. it's funny that this is the last conference. This is the last thing we are celebrating someone's life that was Phil's life, and and here we are laughing and, and having a great time. And mm -hmm. I invite anyone to watch the film with the eyes we saw it. You know, with with you know with a smile, with laugh and. And that's at the end of the Camino. You know, the Camino, always people say, there is hard times in the Camino. There is that in life, if you don't go through those holes, through the darkness, there's no light. And the Camino is like that. The Camino, there is darkness. Well, and, darkness. and I invite everybody, just send me um, an email at philscamino at gmail, or I'll try and work on my um, website a little bit and make it a little easier to get people right to the place where they could watch it online. And if it's a tight moment, if you don't have the... Eight dollars or ten dollars, I'll just send you a code. But um, I would love for people to see it. I still sell the DVD, and there are people who are making donations in Phil's name. And what I'm doing with that is I'm sending DVDs to hospitals, to and to cancer groups to get them into the hands of people who could most maybe most enjoy his message. Is, is there any guide to do like a like a movie, you know, club, like to watch the movie? Is there any like a thing to do after the movie? Have you created any documents that can help us? I'm like, I'm thinking of, you know, here maybe for schools, for people like a lot of people right now, they're doing, you know, this kind of things. And I know that a lot of people would like. Yeah, like a, a discussion guide. Discussion guide, yeah. We have that, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So we'll put everyone in contact with you. We'll also invite everyone. Yeah, Phil's Camino yeah. at Gmail. Just let me know. And... In inglés o en español. My español no es muy, muy bueno, pero... En francés, es bueno en francés. Es bueno en francés, oui. Uh, ¿A italiano? <laughs> ¿Le pagamos italiano? Sí, sí, en italiano va bien, porque hablo italiano, parlo italiano. Uh, uh, Deutsch, ya? Yeah, uh, yeah. No. That's all my job. Ich liebe dich. That's all I know in German. Ich liebe dich. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for me having a great time to, you know, and, and I hope that we can see each other soon, hopefully, you know, the Camino, maybe there, who knows what the Caminos will cross again. Yes, yes. I look forward to meeting everybody who's on here somehow, somewhere. Stranger things have happened, so. Yes. And I invite anyone, you know, to, to help you continue with that movie. Who knows if, you know, the next one may be, you know, 
And I'm yeah, if you so I'm available, I'm very easily reachable on Facebook. And so um, if you find me on Facebook, you can find me through Annie O'Neill. You can find me through Pilgrimage in Place. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a Facebook page for Phil's Camino and for my book, Everyday Camino with Annie. So just find me or Phil's Camino at gmail.com. And um, who knows? Well, let's, let's make a movie together or let's go on a walk together. It's all good. That's my last question. Will they ever be a good Camino comedy movie? Oh, there should be. You know how often you laugh on the Camino? I know. That's why I'm throwing you to say, you know, maybe we'll make a movie together. I'm like, I'm throwing you that. Yeah. Oh, Phil has, I'll, I'll end with one of my favorite stories that Phil used mm -hmm. to tell was I, like the time he laughed the hardest on the Camino. He and Kelly were just exhausted and they came to a cafe and they decided they were going to sit there, have a sandwich, you know, drink a beer, all of that. So they got a table outside. But the way this place was, well, you went inside and you got your food and you walked outside. Mm -hmm. So they just kind of collapsed for a minute. And then they were going inside when someone was coming outside. And, you know, in Spain, they have those pieces of fabric yeah, the, the that you go yeah, through. Plastic, yes, for the flies. Yeah. And he said he was behind Kelly. He said that. The guy was coming out and Kelly was going in and somehow with like the plastic and he had his beer and his sandwich, the top of his sandwich fell off the piece of bread and Kelly stepped right on it. <laughs> and Phil saw this, but the guy didn't see it. And he leaned down and he put it back on his sandwich and walked out. And Phil was just like, the whole thing happened so fast. And was just, you know, this comedy of the timing being so perfect. <laughs> you know, the five second rule or the one step rule. Who cares? If exactly. You know? Exactly. Because what was the guy going to do? Say, no, I'm not going to eat my sandwich. No. Like it looked fine. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Annie, thank you so much. Have a great You're time. You're so with welcome. You. Thank sure. you so much. And thanks everybody for being here. I feel a little at least a little bit jealous that you guys have got to have this whole weekend and I didn't, but I am so happy that I was able to meet you this way. Don't worry. We know, you know, that's one of the famous movies. We will be back. So we will be back. We'll be back. <laughs> Thank you. And best of luck with your projects. And I invite anyone, you know, to go see your work because it's amazing. And Phil's movie for Thank me you. was one of the best work that has ever been made about the Camino because it is about mm. that. It's all the people. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Annie, because, you know, that movie was for me one of the things that put me in my Camino. Wow. You hear that, 